Banjo Ben here with a lot of my new friends. These cabin campers have been enjoying a wonderful camp experience here on the farm in East Texas. And we're here to introduce the latest lesson, Inside Cabin Camp. I hope that you enjoy it. And if you're watching somewhere else besides BanjoBenClark.com, I'd be honored to have you come on board as a Gold Pit member where you can access over 800 lessons for banjo, mandolin, and guitar. All right, let's talk bluegrass rhythm. This is session number two here at Cabin Camp. So in the first session, we talked about fundamentals, about um, how to hold a pick, how to hold our guitar. Most importantly, the overarching message there was to play with as little tension as possible, right? We want to play as relaxed as we can and because we learned that stress and tension are enemies of speed and agility and accuracy. And I don't know if in the jam session out there, if it came to, to mind as you were playing, uh, some of the things that we talked about, it, it did for me. And, um, you know, Richard, you made a comment that it's hard to stand there and play rhythm guitar for an hour. And it is. And whenever you make it harder on yourself by working harder than you need to, then it's that much more difficult. So good stuff there. And I think that uh, I think that'll really help you as you um, as you practice to audit yourself and, and just make sure that we're doing things correctly and, and that we're uh, setting ourselves up for success. So in this session, we're going to be talking about guitar rhythm. And I want to talk about the role of guitar in rhythm and then some theory of rhythm. So talking about uh, the, the timing in particular. And then we'll um, push into some chord changes. And uh, you'd mentioned, Johan, wanting to learn how to spice up going back and forth between chords. And I'd like to get into a little bit of that here. We'll get into more of that as we go throughout the weekend. Um, but let's bring it back to fundamentals first. There's a phrase there on your syllabus talking about bluegrass rhythm. And it says, don't get bigger than you oughta. And what we mean with that phrase is that bluegrass rhythm, because it's often fast, time back into session one, we want to work harder than we need to. You know, this length of this uh, bridge here is just over a couple of inches. It's really not very far, right? So technically, whenever we play bluegrass rhythm guitar, all we've got to do is move that pick a little over two inches and then back two inches, right? But in reality, what we do is usually play about a foot down this way and about a foot up that way. And, and the louder and the faster that we go, the more exaggerated that that can become. So when we talk about auditing finger pressure and our pit grip and this and that, we can also audit and pay attention to how much are we working here? And do we really have to go that far past the first string? Do we really have to go that far past uh, the sixth string as well? Um, when we talk about bluegrass rhythm, we're primarily going to be operating in 4-4 four, four measures, right? Now, we played a song in the jam out there that was in 3-4. What's, what's another name for a song that's in 3-4? A waltz. So what do I mean whenever I say 4-4 four, four and 3-4? Four? Yeah, four beats per measure, a quarter note gets the beat, or three beats per measure. But most of our bluegrass songs are going to be in 4-4. Four, four. So four beats and a quarter note gets um, a beat. So four quarter notes in a measure. Now when we think about the different pieces in a bluegrass band and what their role is in a measure, uh, we can break them each down. But let's start with the bass. The bass is usually playing the root of the chord and then they'll alternate, a lot of times playing the, the five of the scale, right? So what beats does the bass normally play on? What beats of the measure? They play two, two notes per measure, and what beats are they? Yeah, one and three. So if our uh, measure is going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, bass goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And sometimes they'll walk up with quarter notes. One, two, three. One, two, three. In bluegrass rhythm guitar, we will usually mimic what they're doing, right? So you've heard the term boom chuck rhythm, right? And that's just the most basic description of, of standard bluegrass rhythm. We're going to get into more than that. 
but that's what we're doing there. We're going boom, 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 boom. Echoing or mimicking what the uh, bass is doing. Okay, but in all honesty, if we're playing in a bluegrass band and we've got the bass laying down that one and three, they really don't need our help. They, they really don't. In, in fact, in a jam situation, you're really not going to hear what the guitar is doing on the one and three if you're playing bass notes because the bass is just so much bigger. So it turns out that a guitar's role is not primarily on beats one and three. A guitar's role is primarily on beats two and four. What else plays on beats two and four? The mandolin. So the mandolin chop is going to play generally on beats two and four, and our strums are generally going to happen on beats two and four, and that is a formula for bluegrass rhythm, right? So one, two, three, Now we can do a lot more than that, but at least we need to do that to play bluegrass boom chuck rhythm, okay? Um, whenever we're playing in a configuration where we don't have a bass player, that means that our goal or our job as rhythm guitar players is a little bit bigger because now we have to provide that low end that's missing from the bass. And so I'll find that I'll adjust my playing depending on whether or not I have a bass. If I have a bass in my band, I'm going to put more emphasis and more attention on beats two and four to fill those spaces. If I don't have the bass in the band, I will put more emphasis on beats one and three because the, the configuration is really needing to hear that. Let me demonstrate that for you. So if, uh, if I've got a bass in a band, my rhythm would sound more like this. And I'll just do a simple rhythm. I'm playing in a configuration where I don't have a bass player, it's going to sound like, more like this. Okay, do you hear the difference? Right? So that's just part of listening and being aware of what kind of configuration you have and what the band is needing. If you go light on the on the bass notes, when you don't have a bass, then it's, you're, you can lose some of the time and you're, you're missing part of the sound. Um, if you're really wearing out those bass notes and you have a bass, then you're kind of, it's some wasted effort there and there's much more that we can do in the, in the holes. Okay, so I wanna look at what notes we're actually playing whenever we're playing rhythm guitar. And generally speaking, there's all kinds of things we can do. But if you look at this top part of the diagram here, I've got some horizontal lines drawn across here that are meant to be the strings, right? So we have our bass strings down here and our treble strings up here. And then we have an entire measure divided up with timing. And what we're typically gonna have, let's, uh, let's say that we're playing a G chord. We're going to put a third fret down there, okay? And then for our strum, this is important, we're generally going to aim for just our first three strings. And the chord that I'm going to draw for you there is what I call the bluegrass G chord. I don't know if you play this bluegrass G chord, but it's one that I would recommend you playing. And it looks a lot like this. In fact, exactly like this. Why don't you try making this? So I'm using my middle finger to cover that low third fret. The string right beneath that is actually being muted. That A string is being muted by the fatty part of my middle finger. I'm not fretting anything with my index finger. And then I'm using my last two fingers to play the third frets of both of your top strings. There you go. Let me explain to you why this chord is, uh, is important and very, very useful. What do you, uh, do you notice anything in particular about this chord regarding the notes that we're playing in the chord? 
How many notes are in a major chord? Three. There's only two major notes, only two notes in this chord. Is that what you're going to say, James? I was going to say, I know this is nothing but a D and G. Nothing but a D and G. That's exactly right. So we've removed the major third out of the chord. Why do you think we might want to do that? That's exactly right. So this is also known as a power chord. You hear a lot in rock, too. But the tone of the scale that determines if we're in major or minor is the third tone of the scale, right? So here's a major third interval. Here's a minor third interval. Two very different sounds. So if we remove that third tone, which is that B string, now the lead instruments in bluegrass can do a lot more minor sounding stuff over our rhythm chord and it not clash. If I'm playing a big old happy G major chord with the open B string, and all of a sudden someone wants to sing real bluesy like this, man, that's tough to hear, right? But if we cover up that B string and we instead put the fifth, the dominant tone, there by fretting it on the third. Now I could sing however I want and there's no clash because it's not minor and it's not major. It can be either. All right, so the other thing that's handy about that particular fingering of that chord is it leaves our index finger open. Why might that be handy? Play the yeah, yeah. We play all kinds of walks, like I like to do this. Oh, it's a big stretch. Right? Another thing we can do is easily grab a seven chord. I can reach down and grab my seventh chord very easy. And then as James demonstrated, it's also free to do the old G run, right? So whenever I'm playing fast bluegrass, I don't do the full uh, elaborate G run generally, it's just too much going on. So more often it's gonna look like this. Just that. Those are the two most important notes of the G run. And I can easily do that with my index finger and never move the rest of my hand. Okay? All right, so you'll also notice in this strum that happens on beat two that I'm only playing the first three strings on the guitar. Why aren't I playing all the strings? Why aren't we doing this? And instead we do this. These are important questions because it's, it really boils down to, uh, to being aware of what we're playing. We wanna know why we're playing stuff. Those notes are, of course, the highest notes in the chord, and they're the ones that the ear's most easily going to hear. And if we're playing these lower notes, these notes are not distinguishable by ear. It's, it really ends, it's in a range that's quite muddy. That's just not a pretty sound. We want more of a ring. That makes it easier on us. We're not having to move very far. Okay. Then on the third beat, we have another bass note. What bass note are we generally going to play when we're playing a G? What, what other bass note are we going to alternate with? A D, right? So we got it right here. There's a D string. And then we'll have another strum. Okay. Good. Now, just for a moment, let's just, let's just play this. And what I, want, what I want you to do is concentrate on a couple things. One is pick accuracy. So hitting those bass notes that you're aiming for. I remember that taking quite a while. And I still miss some notes here and there. I remember taking quite a while when I was first learning to play bluegrass rhythm and coming out of the just folky strum patterns to be able to accurately hit those bass notes. I have a lesson on the site that's called Pick Accuracy Exercise. And it's a wonderful exercise. We won't go through it here today, but it helps you get more accurate at that. So I want you to pay attention to your pick accuracy. 
I want you to pay attention on your strum of just playing those first three strings. And when we play that strum, I don't want you pushing through with your elbow. I want you to do, again, what we talked about earlier, and you're gonna hit them with the rotation, okay? So we're going to go through all the three of those strings almost simultaneously. We don't want this sound. Okay? We want it a, a single note. So just stay on a G chord with me for now. Work on hitting those notes accurately. Shake off that dollar bill like we talked about. You're whipping through those strings. Now we'll give you one more trick that's going to turn you into a first-rate bluegrass rhythm guitar player. And that is the bass string hammer-on. Okay, that's another reason why we have our index finger free. And this is something that you need, if you're not doing it in your bluegrass rhythm guitar playing yet, you need to make it a staple. To do it, not all the time, but very often. And whenever we go to hit this bass note, right here, we're actually going to hammer on from the second fret into the third fret. It's gonna look like this. I want you to practice just doing that. From two to three. Put your index right behind it. So now let's play the rhythm together and we're gonna, every time we come around to that low G string or that low G note, we're gonna hammer. One, two, ready, go. So we don't play it, Teresa, we don't play it any earlier. We hit just, just the same as when we were playing regular rhythm. Nothing changes with our right hand. In fact, what I want you to do, it's going to sound bad, but just to learn how to do it, go ahead and play the second fret only, down there, okay, and play this. And now just make it better with the hammer up. There you go. You'll get the hang of it. So Rob, work on alternating your bass strings. So after we do that hammer on down here and do one strum, your next bass string is going to be an open D string. Strum, so. Good. Good. All right. Now, if we just play this boom chuck rhythm like this on, on the downbeats, it's going to get a bit monotonous, right? So we need to introduce some syncopation. We need to introduce some backbeat, some upbeat. So we see that we have a lot of space here in our measure that's not being played on. So we have lots of options, don't we? We've got nothing happening on the end of one, on the end of two, three, or four. So we can play things there. Now you'll notice that everything that we played so far on the downbeats were with a downstroke, right? And typically that's the way it's going to be with flat picking or rhythm is that your downbeats are going to have downstrokes, be played with downstrokes, unless you're Tony Rice. And you're, he does whatever he wants to do, and that's totally fine. Or Kenny Smith. 
and your upbeats, your ands, are going to generally be played with upstrokes. So that means that our rhythm notes, whatever we do here, are generally, generally going to be played with upstrokes. So one of the easiest things that we can do is just add an upstroke on the and of two and four. That's, that's kind of the next logical step, right? So here's the interesting thing though. Let's add it on the and of four. Um, we're not going to do the same up strum that we did on the down strum. Um, it's kind of some wasted effort and it can sound a little bit too big.